You're listening to Ecto Portal, a journey into the unknown with Anthony Anderson and Verna Wilson. I hope that you are seated comfortably with the light turned down and the curtains drawn. Welcome once again to another journey into the unexplored, the unexplained Ecto Portal. I'm Anthony Anderson, your host, and I'm here with my co-host, Verna Wilson. And we've compiled, yes, another collection of Freaky Stories 2. That is so unusual. Freaky Stories for Ecto Portal. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Isn't every week a freaky story? (laughs) Yeah. How unusual can you get, right? Exactly. But we, we, you know... We find them. Some of these, they're not... Definitely not really that paranormal in nature, but they're so unusual and crazy, Mm -hmm. and they're unexplained. So to me, that fits in our unexplained, unexplored uh, motif, which is what ectoportal isn't just ghosts. We have a lot of different uh, variations of topics. So these stories kind of fit. The unexplored, uh, mysterious, unexplained does fit our our show. Now that, now that you're explaining that, I think this would be a good time to actually explain to the audience the types of subjects that we cover that are not necessarily considered nor- normal paranormal stories, because I've had a few people tell me, well, why did you cover that story? It's not ex- whatever story it was. They said it's not considered completely paranormal. And I tell people, well, but if it's unknown and it's unexplained, so why don't you explain a little bit about that? Um, yeah, in fact... Uh Someone else asked me the same question out now a couple of years ago when we started, mm-hmm. like a few years back when we started. They said, but that doesn't seem very paranormal. And I said, well, you got to remember the paranormal is also unexplored. It's unexplored to an extent, but it's unexplained too. Nobody really has full explanations for paranormal events, right? Ghosts, mm-hmm. exorcism, UFOs, Bigfoot cryptids. Uh, the psychics, whatever, none of it is fully explained. Nobody has a full explanation of any of it. So it's kind of still unexplained. So when we have paranormal stories, we do ghost stories, we do curses, we do hauntings, uh, we do UFO-related stories, we mm-hmm. do cryptids a lot, um, Bigfoot, uh, we've done uh, magic, mysticism. Yep. Um, all, all kinds of different variations they don't we don't have any one pigeonholed subject and and the point i think when we created this podcast was if we had just done a podcast and there's many like it that only cover paranormal investigations and ghosts and that you see on these shows it's one group after another one mm-hmm. paranormal group after another coming on and talking about the same thing and i didn't want to do a show where we talk about the same thing every single week because right. i think it gets boring for us you can fall into different categories and that's what makes it varied and interesting is that there's no proper explanation for these stories or these events they're a mystery yeah yeah, yeah. and they, they may have a paranormal angle and i think the, the 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 unknown unexplored unexplained is kind of paranormal in in a way itself because some of these things are so strange and there's what happens in these are so odd mm-hmm. that we don't have a way to explain why they are the way they are. But to me, they seem to fit. That's why when we do these, like this series of true and freaky stories, which we'll probably keep doing, there's a lot sure. out there. Oh, there's a lot out there, um, yeah. It seems like a good way to collect, you know, half a dozen each time and just 
discuss them and maybe make connections. Maybe there is paranormal connections that we're not aware of that we might find as we go along too. And also, I think I think it's a good way for us to explore to explore what goes on in the world that doesn't fit into the normal scheme of things. And I remember when I first started this show, and we were and we've had guests on uh, that have that have no explanation for some things that have happened to them. Yeah. We wanted to make it a safe forum for people to come on here and tell their story without feeling that somebody is going to make them explain it or make them or judge them. And, um, and then someday the mystery may be solved, someday it may not. But it's a safe place, and it, it's also a place where it doesn't fall in the normal scheme of things, so it can be told right here. What's interesting is there was, and I remember telling you about this recently, mm -hmm. someone had left a comment, and I think one of our YouTube posts of one of our shows, sure. that said, you guys are a big joke. Why, there's people doing serious investigations and podcasts about the paranormal. You guys are just a joke. Laughing it off. And like, we don't, we do laugh. We do enjoy we have humor conversations. Yeah. We do have humor because life has humor. Um, we, we, we tend to look at ghost stories from different angles. Sometimes we look at it very critical, like, okay, let's, let's be real here. If this happened and this happened, what would you do? We kind of look at things that way, sure. which a lot of people, I think, do. They have any sorts of uh, common sense. You're going you're gonna to approach things in a matter-of-fact way. You're going to go, well, what's the mechanics of what happened? And what, what do we think could have happened? What do we think did happen? Mm -hmm. And what are, what are our beliefs on what happened? We, we cover all that. Right, and I, and I, we, I also cover them with compassion. Yeah. and a look at, and um, the seriousness but there's also times when you have to have a good laugh over some things yeah because well anybody who thinks oh oh you know anybody who has any kind of humor on the show when they're talking about the paranormal that person has never been a paranormal investigator because mm -hmm. i know lots of investigations where joking around having the most fun and humor on investigations triggers paranormal activity it folks. does and it breaks up the tension <laughs> it breaks up it breaks up the atmosphere and actually it draw it draws actually more of it to you i think yep in fact yeah. that would be a fun topic for a future episode is uh humor as a trigger for the paranormal and, and maybe play evp examples of you know people who have joked around and they've gotten a response just to show that you know humor is another emotional response from a human being that can get a response from uh, the other side or Absolutely. wherever you want to call it. I don't know what's the other side. There's not who's to say there is that other side of anything. It could just be, you know, another existence, atmosphere sure. around us, sure. next to us, above us, below us, beside us, the other side of the wall, <laughs> whatever. But yeah, I mean, humor is definitely a, a trigger device yes the same as sadness crying when people recreate like oh this woman used to cry before is she died and it triggers a ghost to come out well it's the same kind of deal it's the same thing yeah we don't intentionally laugh at anything we don't make fun of the paranormal but we no. do talk about situations and stories and wonder what could have happened right so just just so you know we do have humor on the show, so if you're afraid of having laughing while listening to a paranormal podcast, this may not be the podcast. This may for not you. be the one you like then, <laughs> because we because we do have fun here, yeah. and we feel actually it makes the show more interesting when you do. I think it does. Yeah. All right, so let's get on this new batch of uh, true and freaky stories too. Yep. Uh, I'm going to start off with the Lost Franklin Expedition. Okay, the HMS Terror was initially built as a bomb vessel and even participated in several skirmishes in the War of 1812 before Sir John Franklin commissioned it for his uh, doomed expedition. Now, nobody knows for sure why exactly the HMS Terror and the HMS Erebus sank. Weirder still, both boats were found largely intact after nearly two centuries, 80 and 36 foot feet below the Arctic, respectively. Now, theories range from mutiny to lead poisoning and cannibalism. Indeed, this freak story is one for the ages. The doomed Franklin expedition set sail to locate the Northwest Passage with 134 men aboard on May 19, 1845, as Europe powers had long been consumed with, dis with discovering the lucrative trade shortcut to Asia. Under the command of Sir John Franklin, the vessel set sail with 32,000 pounds of preserved meat, 1,000 pounds of raisins, 
and 58,000 gallons of pickles. But two months after leaving England, the ships were sighted for the last time near the Baffin Island between Canada and Greenland. Five men were discharged at the last stop and had no idea how lucky they were as all of the 128 men continued on the journey would die. Now in 1850, three graves dated 1846 on the uninhabited beach, Beachy Island were discovered by an American and British search parties. In 1854, Scottish explorer John Ray searched Pelly Bay and encountered Intuit, Inuits wearing some of the belongings of the long-lost crew. They then told Ray that there were a pile of human bones scattered nearby. Now, many of these remains were cracked in half, suggesting desperation had led the stranded sailors to the resort to cannibalism. Most scholars generally agree that the two ships eventually became stuck on the ice, forcing the crew to abandon ship, where they eventually ran out of supplies and ate each other or died. Now, knife marks were discovered on the skeletal remains found on King William's Island uh, in the 1980s and the 1990s, all but the confirmed the theory that the crew had turned to cannibalism, uh, but a, a grisly 1984 excavation suggested another cause of death, severe lead poisoning. Now, after nearly 140 years, the perfectly preserved body of sailor John Torrington was found frozen stiff with signs of deteriorating health before his death. His tissue and bone samples revealed the fatal levels of lead, likely due to a poorly canned food supply. Researchers believe that the large amount of food needed for the journey was to blame for the sailor's poisoning. With lar barely enough time to safely tin each uh, an exorbitant amount, of the food had been poorly canned and then likely poisoned the sailors, only adding to their deteriorating health upon becoming stranded. Now, the two ships themselves were finally discovered in 2014 and 2016, but experts are still confounded as to the exact cause of their sinking. Uh, lead archaeologist on the terror discovery, Ryan Harris, could only guess. There's no obvious reason for the terror to have sunk, he said. It wasn't crushed by ice, and there's no breach in the hull, yet it appears to have sunk swiftly and suddenly and settled gently on the bottom. And what had happened? Now, a note dated April 1848 discovered under a cairn on King William Island, however, revealed the terrifying truth. The two ships had been locked in ice for over a year, and at that time of the note's writing, 24 men had already died. Francis Crozier, who penned the note, said, The survivors planned on walking to a remote fur trading outpost, hundreds of miles away. Not a single soul survived, and either died from exhaustion, pneumonia, or starvation. Ooh, that sounds awful. What a horrible way to go. Jeez. But I, I would rather die walking of starvation, exhaustion, than the can having cannibalism going on. Yeah, cannibalism, or I, I don't know how how if somebody had lead poisoning, how I mean, how slow would your health take to deteriorate? It would from be that? pretty quick, I would think. Yeah. Because if, if you're eating that many canned goods with lead poisoning every time and, you eat, and it was the only thing you had, yeah, you would eat it, even if you knew you were being poisoned, which they probably didn't. Yeah. You would still continue to eat because it's the only food you have to stay alive. But all that lead Ooh. just has so many horrible ramifications once it builds up. Oh, that's just that's just awful. It I mean, is. the whole thing. Now, this one is uh, about um, a, an actual unknown beast. It's called The Scary Story of the Guvadin Beast. And it takes place in the French countryside um, in the mid-18th century. And uh, they said that it's almost like something out of a fairy tale, um, you know, or a, a fairy tale where there's a wolf, mm -hmm. like a Grimm's tale. And they said most of its 300 victims were women and children. So um, the, the, it didn't take, the newspapers called it the Beast of, of Gavadin um, because of the countryside that it, that it was seen in. And the Beast's first victim was, uh, was um, Jean Boulet. She was a 14-year-old shepherdess, and she was found dead in 1764. Her throat was brutally ripped out entirely, and a 15-year-old uh, followed the next month. Um, they managed to describe the creature responsible as a horrible beast before dying. 
Um, as regional newspapers um, jumped at the story and they published any available accounts, um, more hundreds were mauled and their throats and chests were ripped out. And the, um, the, the gruesome side of events were made international, they made the international headlines and things continue to get worse. So of course they all jumped on the, the details. So as a, an examination of the, of the victims showed clear signs of claw and teeth marks, um, very sharp ones, the, pr the press continued to describe the animal as having black fur, a large chest, and a mouth full of terribly serrated fangs, like these long, horrible like sharp fangs. Well, infantry leader uh, for the search, uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, Duhamel, he organized a hunting party of 30,000 volunteers to find and kill this beast. And he motivated uh, the citizens to join um, of, of, with the promise of putting an end to the, to the horrible killings, as well as a reward um, equivalent to a year's salary. So uh, following um, the grassroots campaign to destroy the creature, um, King Louis, um, he sent his personal bodyguard, Francois uh, Antoine, to take matters into his own hands. And it was in September of 1765 when Antoine and his men managed to kill a rather large wolf and then returned to Versailles to collect their reward. So for the next few months, there were no further attacks um, on Guvaden until the nightmare started again. And witnesses continued to describe a beast um, that, that the, the, descri the description was similar, but it became even more exaggerated. Uh, some say it was supernatural and bipedal, and some say it was part wolf and part man. And uh, Jean Chastil, who was a farmer, he was tired of losing um, the people he cared about and living in utter fear. He wandered into the mountain on purpose, armed with nothing but a pistol and a few silver bullets. And after taking a rest to read the Bible in hopes of luring the creature, it appeared. Chastel shot and killed the beast and triumphantly presented it to the king. And some accounts claim that when the wolf's stomach was open, a cornucopia of human remains tumbled out. Ew. That sounds awful. Werewolf. Yeah. Now, while the legend inspired Robbie, Robert Louis Stevenson, 1879 book, Travels with the Donkey, um, in the in, in the Savannas and and the feature film adaptions like uh, Christopher Gaughan's 2002 horror horror film uh, Brotherhood of the Wolf. Historians have yet to agree what exactly happened at Guvaden. Um, some say it was a prime example of mass hysteria and that there was nothing but a pack of wolves that caused the killings, and others said that uh, an escaped lion or one particularly rabid wolf was responsible. But uh, nothing's really clear. Um, nobody really knows. Hundreds were brutally maimed by something that they could only describe as a beast. And um, in the story was actually considered more horrifying than fiction and there there's really nothing more to say about it because nobody has any proof yeah it's well i mean if they really had if they split it open and human organs came out human remains now yeah. does that mean it could be in two things werewolf like yeah. anthropy or uh -huh. it ate a human and that was what was in its stomach when they gutted it well, then he must have just recently eaten a human because wouldn't it, wouldn't it have digested by now? But if you had 300 victims, it probably did just eat a human. <laughs> There's lots of shepherds out there. Yeah. You know, it, it's hard to say, if, but if it wouldn't be recognizable as a human, like a particular person, mm -hmm. because it would have been partially digested, ripped apart, you wouldn't know who it was. But... I don't know. I, I'm kind of curious if that was the case. Like, did it have human organs or was it human parts inside the animal? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or it could have been another um, beast that the animal ate that looked like large bones or something. Yeah. Not necessarily human. Maybe they just thought it was human. Yeah. I've seen, I actually have Brotherhood of the Wolf. It's an interesting movie. Oh, you it's have? a Canadian, oh. French Canadian movie. Oh, okay. It's actually shot in French Canadian. So there's like subtitles, but it's really good. Now, this took place in the 18th century in France, and we all know that there's a lot of animals that existed back then, or breeds of animals that don't exist anymore. So it could have been an extra large breed of wolf that we don't see, because most wolves are kind of small and grayish looking, yeah, and you know, brown we, looking. We, we've had a brown number fur. of stories, especially in stories from Europe and villages where these giant wolf creatures are attacking. Yeah. And they're larger, and they, you know, they're like little red riding Six hood. foot long or eight foot long. Yeah. yeah. But I wonder if back then there was a different type of wolf, wolf that existed. Yeah, larger. 
that maybe died out and now we just have wolves that are descendants of these larger wolves. Do you know what I mean? Died out or, or was hunted out. Yeah or, yeah, or driven out and just died out, period. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting. It, it sounds to me like it could just be a really large wolf. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't know, maybe in France they had larger. I mean, it's again, it's it's Europe. It's Europe and a lot of, and as we mentioned, lots of breeds of animals existed then that you don't see anymore. Yeah. And yep. Well, um, and, and it's true that Europe is filled with those uh, with large wolf fairy tales. And it, it makes sense if they, I, I wonder if they ever dug around the, the countryside, if they would ever find the a bones. large wolf bone, bone that would prove it. Well, look at that. We did that episode about the Black Shook, how they dug up the one by the cathedral, and it was, what, what did they say, eight feet long? Yeah. And it was huge. Yeah. So there you go. There's an example right there. Yep. Now, you, um, have a, you have another one here. Yeah, I have one called the Taos Hum. It's about a sound that's heard. Some residents and visitors in the city of Taos, uh, New Mexico, have for years been annoyed and puzzled by a mysterious and faint low-frequency hum in the desert air. Now, only uh, about 2% of Taos residents reported hearing the sound. Some believe it's caused by unusual acoustics. Others suspect mass hysteria, our old favorite words, or some secret sinister purpose. Now, whether described as a whir, a hum, or a buzz, and whether psychological, natural, or supernatural, no one has been able to locate the sound's origin. Uh, the weird thing is the survey re- re- revealed that those who claim to hear the sounds actually hear different sounds, suggesting the experiences may be subjective and not actually objective sounds. I'm pretty certain that no one in particular hears the same sound. So, I actually, this story is not new to me because I knew people who visited Taos, New Mexico and who, li- and who lived there a short time. They have heard that sound. It's, it's, a, it's like a vibrating, humming sound. And they think it's because of the area they live in and these people, they they were very much in tune with energy, and they feel that they lived in an area where um, there was a lot of energy coming from the desert and from this from the energy. Like it's it's like a high energy spot, and it vibrates through the through the town. See, I wonder if it's something an energy magnetic energy in in in, in connection with the the land, the actual. Mm-hmm. Location. I, I think on the Earth there are probably spots that where that does happen. It creates sure. this weird frequency and hum. Mm-hmm. Um, I have one more to go with this. Uh, it's it's a completely different topic. It's a deadly exorcism. Okay. As we talk about exorcism now and oh, yeah, on the we, show, yeah, we do for sure. Uh, in August of 2016, in North London, 26-year-old Kennedy uh, life began acting strange and aggressive following a pain in his throat. He reportedly bit his father and threatened to cut off his own penis and complained of a python or snake inside him before his family restrained him to a bed with cable ties and excessive force. Now, the BBC had reported that the family then set about attempting to cure Kennedy through restraint and prayer over the next three days, the court was told. His brother Colin told the police, It's clear that the thing was in him, what we believed was a demon, because it was not natural. It was clearly trying to kill him, he said. We had to restrain him for himself. It was clear if we didn't restrain him, he would have tried to harm people in our family. Kennedy, uh, his life had been, his life, he had been bound to his bed for three days without medical attention when his brother called emergency services, explaining that Kennedy, that he was complaining of dehydration, he appeared to have developed breathing issues, and he was pronounced dead at 10, 17 a.m. Now, the independent paper reported, uh, while police were at the house, Colin uh, Eif allegedly carried out an attempted resurrection by chanting and praying for Mr. Eif. All seven of Kennedy Eif's family members were accused of manslaughter, false imprisonment, and causing or allowing the death of a vulnerable adult. A post-mortem examination revealed over 60 wounds, including a possible bite on Kennedy Eif's body. And his father, Kennedy Ife, along with four of his brothers, sustained injuries as well. Now, the BBC also reported that Kennedy Ife told jurors he ordered his sons to take shifts and use overwhelming force, but denied that an association with cults, a cult, or secret societies played any part in the death. And after a four-day jury deliberation, all seven family members were cleared of charges on March 14, 
2019. Gee, all recently. Yeah, last year. How Jeez. weird is that? Well, they handled that the wrong way. Why didn't they get help from medical, you know, from medical experts to come in and see what was wrong before, um, instead of taking matters into your own hands? I was going to say, if the victim had a, was bitten, you could take the uh, teeth impressions of the rest of the family to find out who sure. bit him. Sure. Just saying. Yeah. I would. That's what I would have done is took impressions of each of the family members to see if they were the ones that did it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's a weird story, though. Yeah. I, I know this sounds kind of crazy to say, but this is when we first started Ecto Portal was when this happened. And I wondered if it was news in England, and we, I, I would have liked to have heard about it back then. I mean, I would have liked to have heard about it as a... I don't, a I don't even remember it in the news at the time, either. Do you? Well, we used to get news articles yeah. um, talking about the paranormal or what was going on at the time, and a lot of them were very recent. So this must have been an article that that people were following for for a case back then. I would yeah, think. we we could have possibly had reported on it back then too. Yeah, but um, but it's know. awful. It's yeah. uh, I mean th- that's that's handling things the wrong way. It's like yeah. if somebody's acting like that, you get medical help first, and you don't take them into your own hands. It's just weird. Yeah. And just think someone 200 years from now is going to read about this going, oh, well, they were obviously, you know, someone was mentally ill. and They're, they're <laughs> going to think that, yeah. There'll be two podcasters like us talking about it 200 years from right. now. Right. <laughs> and guess what? We agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah, exactly. All right. What do you got a weird one, too? This one's another one about animals, and it has to deal with dead animals. And uh, this takes place in Pennsylvania, in Auburn, Pennsylvania, in 2015. All these recent stories. So it takes place with with the Brett Sias family. They uh, decided to insulate their home and and they discovered that it already been insulated with scores of dead animal carcasses. What? Yeah. (laughs) The animals were wrapped in newspapers from the 1930s and 40s and were among um, half-used spices, you know, probably to preserve it, Mm -hmm. and other items. uh, or, Or no, they were among some spices that were probably in jars, like, you know, spices you put in your kitchen or something and after removing the items they they uh sent hundreds of artifacts and carcasses to an expert in the in kurtz in cutstown um to examine it and the expert attributed that the rotting animals in the walls um to to powwow or dutch magic which is a ritual originating in the culture of pennsylvania dutch to treat ailments and gain physical and spiritual protection the pennsylvania dutch were a group of german-speaking settlers to pennsylvania in the 1600s and 1700s and they were often of lutheran mennonite or amish faiths um and uh Many of the spells um, deal with the care of livestock, finding water, or the treatment of minor ailments reflecting the condition and and concerns of um, early American settlers. But powwow also has within its tradition darker spells such as um, conjuring demons. So um, one ritual um, is in in the tradition is a hex to create loyalty in a dog. So to, att- you, to attach a dog to a person, you provided that, provided that nothing else was used to, to coax him, um, try to draw some of your blood and let the dog eat it along with his food and he'll stay with you. And the mold found on the rotting carcasses uh, in the Bretzia's home caused illness among the family members. They said the odor hasn't gone away. Ew, Ooh, that rotting yuck. I don't know if I'd want to stay in the I, house yeah, after that. I never, I never heard of a hex to get a dog to stay with you. Most dogs... L- don't need that kind of coaxing you must really be a sad person if you need a hex to have well the, the dog doesn't like you that's another that's story, another story right? yeah so i don't know that's that's, that's yeah weird. i don't know about that one um so. here's a delightful story uh 2012 so not not as recent as some of these others about florida devil worshiping um friends noticed that daniel harkins a 35 year old school teacher needs near saint per- petersburg florida started acting strangely in June of 2012, developing an interest in demonic rituals. Soon after, she was arrested for abuse of seven of her former students, as the Tampa Bay Times reported the following, that Daniel Harkins told the kids they needed to get rid of their bodies of demons, um, to get to rid their bodies of demons as the group gathered before dusk Saturday around a small fire near St. Petersburg Pier. They should cut their skin to let the evil spirits out. 
Police said she told the children then they needed to burn the wounds to ensure that the spirits would not return. Somebody's a little mental Oh, that's Ill. scary. Uh, when Harkins held a lighter to one teen's hand, wind blew the flame out. Police said that that prompted her to douse his hand in perfume before setting it on fire. Oh, yikes. The boy suffered said second-degree burns, police said. Now, another teen was cut on the neck with a broken bottle. Police said Harkins used a flame to heat a small key, which she then used to catarize the wound. The police were notified because a friend of one of the students who participated in the ritual raised alarms. However, none of the students themselves told their parents about the event or would comment following the arrest of Harkins for aggravated battery and child abuse. Now, investigators that have spoken to Harkins, but she didn't spell out what type of religion would require such drastic measures. She hasn't informed us exactly of what she was trying to accomplish with this. Uh, the St. Petersburg Police Department had indicated. So that's... I don't, that she was a school like, teacher? Yeah, but that doesn't sound like... That's not demonic rituals to me. That's mentally ill. That's mentally... Cutting that's yourself. mental illness. That's mental illness. And she used the demonic thing as yep. an excuse. That's how she lured them to... God, she was one sick puppy. But, but what gets to me is these kids actually... Believed did it. Did what she said. And believed it. I would have just ran off and just said, the heck with you, lady. Yeah, but there's, kids are inf- influential. You know, you can get them to believe a lot of things. And this is just, it's kind of a sad story, really, that these kids were involved in that. Well, some of them could have gotten seriously hurt. Yeah. I mean, they were just lucky. I mean, second degree burns is bad enough. Yeah, that's horrible. Yeah. And I'm sure you have one more cheery note yeah. to finish off our uh, right. true it's freaky stories. It story. takes place in Utah. It's a murder-suicide, and it's... Another sad recent story. Um, This happened in September of 2014. A Utah teen returned to his home to find his parents and three siblings dead. And in a notebook, um, a to-do list had been scribbled on the pages. The list looked as if the parents were ready to go on vacation. Items such as feed the pets, find someone to watch after the house were were written. And the Salt Lake Tribune reported it it appeared to be murder-suicide But there were no suicide notes, no prior indication that they would do this, no explanation. The police couldn't figure out why two parents would kill themselves and three of their four children. And for a year, no one exactly knew what happened to the family or what would drive the parents to do something, you know, that horrible. In January, the police released more chilling details in the case. According to accounts from family members and an investigation by police, the parents were driven by a belief that the, that the apocalypse was coming and an obsession with a convicted killer. And as the Washington Post reported, friends and family told the police that the parents were worried about the evil in the world and wanted to escape a pending apocalypse. But most assumed they just wanted to move somewhere off the grid. Investigators also found letters written by Christy Strack to one of the state's most infamous infamous convicted killers. His name was Dan Lafferty. He was convicted in 1984 for the fatal stabbing of his sister-in-law and her one-year-old daughter. And according to trial um, testimony, he killed the victims at the order of his brother, Ron Lafferty, who claimed to have had a revelation from God. And the story became a book called Under the Banner of Heaven. Police said that Christy Strack became friends with Don Lafferty, Dan Lafferty, and she and her husband even visited him in prison. Oh, how lovely is that? That's crazy or what? Well, it's a, it sounds like they're both wrapped, both of these cases, they were, as far as, they were wrapped up in like religious... Yeah, and know, end times. End and, times, an apocalypse, pending apocalypse. And they kind of lived in their own little cult world for that yeah that's kind of freaky it'd be like Ugh, why do you have to kill your why do, this is what i never understand about these kind of people yeah you can have a religious fanaticism and you right. want to you want to kill yourself so you can move away from this horrible yes sinner planet of the devil or whatever you know you want to be with jesus mm-hmm. go be with jesus but you know what give your kids their own decision yeah to, to don't, live. don't don't force it on your kids yeah to yeah. kill your kids and take them with you I thought thou shalt not kill. Whatever happened to that commandment? I, that, that seems to have been forgotten. In Even all killing it. yourself. Wasn't that thou shalt not kill that's, still? That's, that, that falls still along with that. Yeah. I've always wondered, you know, with religious folks, some religious folks, I'm not putting down religious folks, I'm putting down some yeah, yeah, who, yeah. Follow, who follow... Fanaticism. Fanaticism, yeah, <laughs> fanatical folks. That, that, that doesn't come into play about not, thou shalt not kill? 
I would think it would. I would think it would too, but well, I just it again. We're sliding into mental and making illness, friends sure. with a prisoner who did horrifying things. I mean, well, what? look what they called the book though, under the banner of heaven. So they probably thought, oh, this guy had a revelation, so he killed his this his sister in law and her baby. So yeah. they're thinking, oh, we could go before the apocalypse and we should kill our our kids. And I, you know, who knows what they thought? Who knows what they thought? Yeah, it's um. You know, I mean, I, I know that in prison, a lot of people make friends with people who do bad things and and they, they try to give them a chance to redeem themselves or to, you know, become a better person. But, I mean, this, this is a family with kids and who... Yeah, I just don't, I don't understand. Know. I mean, if, yeah. you, if you're suicidal and you're going to kill yourself, it's very sad and tragic and you it should be better if you got help. But if you're going to kill yourself... Killing someone else to take them with you? Yeah. No, that's not really your your thing. It's not something you should be able to decide. Yeah, and and that note could have been a note, hoping that the kid who came home would find it and. Yeah, that's horrible. That's like, oh my fa- uh, that's, my I parents mean, were going to go on vacation. Oh wait, they're dead. Oh look, they killed the rest of my family. That whoever I mean, who, that when that kid came home, he's probably yeah. traumatized uh, about all of this. Of course, what a horrible. I would think way he to, would be. Yeah. Your whole family's gone at once. Oh, how awful. Yep. Yep. So there we go. Some happy, <laughs> true and freaky those stories. Are, those are freaky stories. Yep. Another half dozen for you folks. And uh, we'll, like I said, one, every once in a while, we'll, we'll keep doing more of these just because they're, they're bizarre. Yeah. And um, no doubt we'll find more. Yep. I'm sure. Yep. Um, so I guess uh, until next week, we'll go ahead and say goodbye. See Bye. you next week. Bye. Royalty-free, copyright-free music by Ross Bugden.